Matthew 16, we're going to be looking today at signs of the times. Beginning at verse 1, Matthew 16, reading to verse 4, Matthew writes, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening, hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now, as we enter into our study today in Matthew chapter 16, we need to remember the context. Jesus has just fed a multitude of 4,000 men, and that did not include women and children. So in order to avoid any complications, we're told that he sent away the multitudes, and then he left the area. Matthew tells us in chapter 15, verse 39, that he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala. But when you cross-reference that with another account found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, it, verse 10, Mark 8, verse 10 tells us that Jesus came to an er area called Dalmanutha. Now, Dalmanutha would have been close to the city of Magdala, and so they're both correct. So while they're in that area, a coalition of religious leaders have come, and they've come in order to discuss and debate with Jesus Christ. They wanted to dispute him. Mark gives us a little more insight into what is taking place when he tells us in chapter 8, verse 11, that the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. So he used the word dispute as well as the word testing. To dispute means to argue with, and testing speaks of testing someone with malicious intent. So what is provoking them to come to Jesus in order to argue and test him? Now we need to know that even as it says in verse 1, Pharisees and Sadducees, we need to know that these are people who are in positions of religious authority. And what is happening at that time is they're alarmed at Jesus' growing popularity. They're slowly becoming aware that they're in danger. They're in danger of being replaced by Jesus Christ. You see, these religious leaders had grown to love being admired as well as being followed. And they're about to lose their position of esteem in Jewish society. Jesus, when he speaks about them in Matthew 23, verses 6 and 7, speaking of them, says, They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So they, looking at Jesus, these who were hungry for man's attention, looking at Jesus, considered him to be unsophisticated, untrained, untaught, and uncredentialed. In John, in chapter 7, verse 15, it says that the Jewish authorities marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? So when they asked the question concerning Christ, how does this man know letters, having never studied, we need to know that the word letter or letters refers to Scripture. They're surprised, in other words, at his knowledge of the Bible. Because he was conversant with Scripture, he interpreted Scripture, and he taught it with clarity and wisdom. And so naturally, they began to wonder, how does he know Scripture so well? And secondly, they said, having never studied. When he says, having never studied, they're saying he's never sat at the feet of a learned rabbi. This is a man who was brought up in a trade. Jesus was only a carpenter. He's never attended university or any formal school of learning. So how does he know letters having never studied? Well, in spite of all of this, his, his manner of teaching was with authority as well as with a growing popularity. We, we saw in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, how Matthew said, so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as, as one having authority and not as the scribes. And so... The scribes, the legal experts, the Pharisees, even the Sadducees were having a problem with the Lord Jesus Christ. But, according to Mark 12, 37, the common people heard him gladly. So as popularity became a growing threat to the authority and prestige that they had held with the people, and it, 
And, and this is going to be revealed more completely later on in his, in his ministry. Because when you look in John 11, verses 47 and 48, it says there, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. Later on, they said in John 12, 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. He has a growing popularity. He's become a growing threat. These two groups have formed a coalition to oppose him. Normally, this would have been completely unheard of, by the way. They were so different from one another. On one hand, you have the Pharisees, the separated one. When you look a little bit at the history of these whom are referred to as Pharisees, you'll see that the Pharisees were drawn from what was called today the blue collar or the working class. Many of them made a living from a trade, even like Paul, who was a Pharisee. Because we see in Acts chapter 18, verse 3, that Paul is said to be a tent maker. And so the Pharisees were normally drawn from the working class, and they had a trade to support themselves. They were very, very conservative and very fundamental in their theology. They held to religious tradition, a tradition that was equal to the revelation of Scripture, and they were looked at as being very conservative as they're in their religion. But then you had the Sadducees. The Sadducees were generally drawn from the aristocratic class, and many of the high priests and chief priests were from the Sadducees, and they had made their fortunes operating lucrative temple concessions. The Sadducees cared nothing for rabbinic tradition. They had no problem compromising religious principles. Sadducees claimed to believe scripture but they were liberal in their theology as well as materialistic in their lifestyle. And you'll see in Acts chapter 23, verse 8, that they didn't believe in angels, immortality, resurrection, or anything else that was supernatural. So what you have is you have Pharisees who are conservatives, who are in a coalition with Sadducees who were the exact opposite. But they had one thing in common, and that was a desire to see Jesus silenced. So they've conspired to put Jesus to the test, and the Pharisees are in the lead. The psalmist in chapter 38, verse 12, Psalm 38, 12 says, Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. And that's what's taking place here. They are laying snares before Christ. They're attempting to test him. And as it says, they came with the purpose of testing him. Again, the word testing in the Greek language, pirazzo, speaks of testing maliciously. That's a completely foolish thing to do, by the way, to test the Lord. Proverbs 11.21 says, Though they join forces, the wicked will not go unpunished. And so here they come. And notice what they're saying here in verse 1. It says, The Pharisees and Sadducees came testing him, and they're asking that he would show them, notice, a sign from heaven. They want to see a sign from heaven. Now, why would they say, can you please show us a sign from heaven? Their belief was very simple. True prophets do heavenly signs. Demons perform earthly signs, but true prophets perform heavenly signs. In John 6, verses 30 through 33, it says, They said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they're wanting a heavenly sign. Now Mark tells us that his reaction was frustration and sorrow, Mark 8, 12 says, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Matthew says, verse 2, he answered and said to them, when it's evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky's red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Then he sweetly says, hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, 
but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The signs of the times. Red sky in the evening usually means good weather next day. Red sky in the morning usually means a storm is coming. You can predict the natural, but cannot see signs of the times. And that is true to this day. You see, we have experts that predict trends in every area of life. The stock market has experts who predict trends. Fashion industry, entertainment industry, music industry all have experts that predict trends. Marriage and family experts predict trends. We have experts identifying trends in education, in politics, in ecology, real estate. And you'll even get, I, can, I get, and I don't solicit them, but they'll send it to me via email. Uh, I will get organizations that have been established to send me information related to trends in religion. So there are trends and predictors of trends all through every segment of our society. Our society is capable of identifying trends, but our society remains blind to spiritual truth. See, I believe that the church is in a great battle right now, but many are blind to it. Many who are professing Christians are losing sight of our reason for existence, and the society that we live in doesn't see our necessity. I still remember receiving a letter from a neighbor when we had first moved into here, a neighbor who wrote to me, and was complaining because our cars were parked in their neighborhood and didn't think that the church had any value. I still remember somebody posting a letter in uh, one of the newspapers in, in Ontario saying uh, how they were looking forward to the day when the church was no longer on the face of the earth. And I wrote back and said, that day is coming, it's called the rapture, and when that happens, you're not going to be very happy when we are no longer here on the face of the earth. Because God has placed us here to, to hold back the evil, and that's exactly what we do. But some people are forgetting the purpose of the church. I want to spend some time looking at that with you in just a moment. We need to remember that Jesus gave the church what has been called the Great Commission. We need to remember that that commission that Jesus gave to us constitutes what is called the marching orders that we've received. We've received these marching orders as the church from him. You can see this Great Commission actually as it is given to you in all four Gospels as well as the book of Acts. And if you took the time to see that, you can see how it's pasted together, you can place it together and see a more complete picture. But normally what we look at is Matthew chapter 28, and in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we read, therefore, Jesus is saying, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That is what has been typically referred to as the Great Commission. But I want you to see something about it because in many mission organizations, they have used this as the commission to evangelize because Jesus said, therefore, go. And so they will say, see, we the church are to go. But when you read this, you need to remember that the language, all language has various tenses and all and they have what are called main verbs, and in Matthew chapter 28, there is what is called a main verb, the central verb that is to distinguish what the purpose of that is. The main verb is not the word go, go being a verb. The main verb in that verse is make disciples. And what Jesus was saying is as you go, when you go, where you go, make disciples. But what is a disciple? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. The commission of the church is to teach all things that Jesus commanded. That's what our purpose is. So when we go, while we go, and where we go, as people are come to faith in Christ, the responsibility of the church is to teach the full counsel of God. That's what the church is to do. Jesus said, teach them to obey all things that I have commanded. Well, that commission is sadly disregarded today, disregarded, and that has occurred to the hurt of the church, signs of the time. 
What is the general condition of the church throughout the world today? The church is in need of solid teaching as well as an emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is in need of solid teaching as well as an emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit. And many pastors are not teaching the whole counsel of God to the hurt of their churches. The way that you teach the whole counsel of God is verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And it's that kind of method of approaching disciple making that saturates the church with biblical knowledge, as well as exhorting us to biblical practice. That's what the Apostle Paul clearly stated when he was speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, he said, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I've given to you the A to the Z of God's counsel. That occurs best today through a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible. When the church is taken through the Bible, it develops discernment and is protected from error because God's word gives us the ability to discern between truth and error. If you take notes, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15 says, God is the one who gave these gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. You see, pastors who love the sheep will be careful to teach the whole counsel of God. It's the teaching of God's word that equips saints. It's the teaching of God's word that helps to establish a direction in life. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. So the, the pastor has been given the, the charge to give God's word to God's people. And he's called by God to faithfully give forth his word with faith as well as conviction. In Malachi, when we're going through Malachi in chapter 2, verse 7, Malachi wrote, The lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge. And from his mouth, men should seek instruction because he's a messenger of the Lord Almighty. When he said that the lips of the priest are to preserve, that word preserve means to guard it. The lips of the priest, the, the priest is to guard God's word. He's supposed to protect it from the intrusions of error. And that's why he said the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge. And from his mouth, men should seek instruction. So people should come to the religious leader, to the pastor in the New Testament sense, so that they might receive instruction concerning the ways of God. Why is that? Because he is a messenger of the Lord Almighty. And that's how the pastor ought to be viewed, and that's how the pastor ought to view himself. You see, it takes faithfulness to God and a love for God in order that that provokes a person who's ministering the word to give the whole counsel of God. Paul was saying in 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, the appeal we make doesn't spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. We have been, listen carefully, entrusted with the gospel. So we don't modify it. We don't change it. We don't try to make it more acceptable to the hearer. What our responsibility is, because we've been entrusted with this message, what our responsibility is, is to give it as it has been given to us. But the problem is, is today, many people do not want to hear that. They don't want that. Some pastors have become hesitant to teach God's word, the whole council, because of the way that people respond. And some people can respond by getting very angry. 
In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, it reads, Then said I, oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. I don't want to go. I'm too young. I have no experience. I'm wet behind the ears. God says, don't be saying that you're a youth. What you're saying is timeless. What you're saying is my word. You just give it the way I command you, and I'll be with you. But some pastors are afraid. They're hesitant to teach God's counsel because people don't always respond well. When, when Paul was, was instructing a young man by the name of Timothy, he said to him, you need to be faithful and you need to continually teach the word. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, writing to a young pastor, he said to him, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He said, convince, that means preach with conviction. He said, rebuke, bring people into the discipline of God's guidelines. He said, exhort, which is an appeal to action. He said, do it with long suffering, that means patient endurance. And he said, and teaching. Teaching produces a change of behavior. See, sometimes when people begin to speak about spiritual truth, they speak about things that they have learned, but they're not necessarily speaking about things that they do. And so we have today kind of moved into what has been referred to as a Grecianized or a Greek methodology of thinking. The Greeks had this, this, this belief that an assimilation of information was education. So the more I know, the more educated I am. And that was a Greek way of thinking. If I am in schools and I receive certain, we'll call degrees, if I have been under a certain mentor who has mentored me in his ways, if I'm under, we'll say, a Socrates or an Aristotle or some, and I have learned the things that he says, then the information that I have taken in is equal to educa education. But the Jews didn't think that way. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you want, if you do them. In the Hebrew way of thinking, it is not just information, because information is just that until it's assimilation. And when it's assimilation, then it produces transformation. And so the way that you know a passage is not only just saying, I've got that information, it's the transformation of the life due to that information. And that's why there are many people today who say they're Christians because they have been educated in Christian churches or Christian schools. But when it comes to their lifestyle, they live no differently than somebody who would not even profess to know Jesus Christ. Because what they have is information, but there's been no transformation. And what is happening today is we may give information, but it requires us to receive the word with faith so that there might be production of a transformed life. God wants us to live differently in this dark world. But there are some who are professing Christians who are referred to as practical atheists, meaning they may know things here, but it hasn't changed things in the way that I live. We receive the word of God in our head. It soaks our heart and finds its application in our hands. That's Christianity. And there are a lot of people, if you ask them, are you a Christian? We'll say, oh yeah. How do you know? Well, I was baptized. So that's how you became a Christian? Yes, I was raised in a Christian home. I was baptized. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I was sharing yesterday at a, uh, a men's breakfast in South Del Monte, Calvary Chapel, and I've said this to you before, but bears repetition here. And I said, you know, I was raised in a religious discipline so that I had a cousin named Carlos, and Carlos was a Jehovah's Witness, and I was raised as a Roman Catholic. I, I had received my baptism, I received my communion, I received my confirmation. I was raised as a Catholic, being raised as a Catholic, and my cousin being raised as a Jehovah's Witness. And I was sharing with the men that my cousin and I argued about God, faith, Jesus, religion, or smoking pot. 
That's a fact. I took a hit. Yeah, God, you know God. He took a hit, but you're wrong. So it was the blind leading the blind. I was sure that what I knew was right. But my life undermined everything I said I believed. And there are a lot of people today who are exactly that way. I believe in Jesus Christ. I go to church on Christmas and Easter. But they don't walk with the Lord daily, you see? Bible studies. You do not know the signs of the times, Jesus is saying. And guess what? A lot of believers to this day do not see the signs of the times. Pastors being afraid to teach the whole counsel of God because people get mad and hurt feelings when they're convicted. And pastors are afraid to see someone disturbed and to leave. There's this, this forgive me, this sounds mean. Just, just look at me and say, well, he's just, you know, some just old man. He doesn't know. People are more into going after that Pokemon <laughs> than Jesus Christ. It's a fact. It's a fact. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not knocking a man. You want to run around looking for Pokemon, whatever. I don't even know what that is. All I'm seeing is people are crashing into trees. <laughs> and they're falling off of cliffs. And I'm nuts. We're more caught up with the moment than we are with eternity. We're more caught up following that than Jesus Christ. Somebody said, you know, you ought to put one of those things here in, in, the, in the church. You'll have a place to be filled with people. <laughs> There's probably some truth to that. But see, we're afraid to tell the truth. But Paul said, no, we please God and not men. And pastors are supposed to say, I, I have someone that I have to give an account to. And it isn't just to my church. It's to God himself. What did you do with my message? Well, you know, Lord, I, I didn't like the fact that people got upset and walked out. So I kind of diluted it a bit so that they keep coming back. But what did you give them for their eternity? Oh, I gave them popular speeches. I gave them information. I gave them, did you give them my son? Did you equip them for works of service? Did you teach them who Jesus is so that they could leave and add the things of their life that are good to what they know about God and take it to the world? Well, no, I, I, I got tired of seeing people get up and walk out. I got tired of them slamming doors. I got tired of the letters. I got tired of the anger. I just got tired of it all. And I just wanted people to come back. And I thought, if I just give them some soft things, if I speak to them smooth words. But you didn't honor my word. And you see, that's the, that's the signs of the times. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. And that's why Jesus said, you cannot discern the signs of the times. Christians ought to be equipped to discern the signs that we're living in, the times that we're living in. And when we consider the church and the health of the church, by and large, it's really not healthy. Believers in Christ have slowly, but surely many have become apathetic, the church losing its influence. What has led to that de decline when we look at signs of the times? What, what has led to that decline? Let me give you a few things. First, I've already mentioned this. Many pastors resist teaching the whole counsel of God. The message for the moment has taken precedence over equipping the saints for eternity. Second, the Bible's no longer regarded as God's final authority for many. It's viewed as an old book. The Bible's not regarded as the truth. It's one version of truth that applies only to those who believe it. And yet the Bible in Psalm 119 verse 160 says it like this, The entirety of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How important is it for the gospel to be presented accurately? Paul said in Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, 
Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, as we have already said. So now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. That's pretty strong. It's a very strong word coming from the Apostle Paul. Why? Because there are people who come in and dilute the message, transform the message, and in doing so, empty the message of its power to transform. There's a third thing, and that is that false teachers have crept into the church and are honored now by professing Christians. If I stand up and I mention somebody who's a false teacher by name, oh, oh people get so mad. They do. It's not that I... How do I want to put this? Because I really want to be, I don't want you to hate me for no reason. I'll give you a good reason if you'd want, but <laughs> I, I, don't really, I don't really have that great a concern whether people like or dislike me. With that said, I at the same time don't want to hurt people's feelings either. So it's kind of a, it's a difficult path to, to walk, to try and tell the truth, to say it with love, and, and prayerfully to be understood. But I can tell you this, that when you identify what is false, there are quite a number of people who want to argue with you about it. And what has happened is false teachers have crept into the church, into the body of Christ. You see them on TV all the time. They have radio programs, magazines. And I'm not speaking about the obvious cults that you're very familiar with, but some who are professing the true Christ who as they're preaching a false gospel, if their message is critiqued and, and, and messages uh, includes a reference to that, then you have people who are really upset. But Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31 said it like this. In Jeremiah 5, 31, he said, the prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority. But he goes on to say, and my people, and my people love it this way. That's the truth. We're in the book of Amos in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. I was mentioning this this last Wednesday. And in Amos chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, God is pronouncing judgment on the nation of Israel. And he says, I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazareth. The word Nazareth is uh, in reference, the word Nazareth means a consecrated one. It was in reference to those within the confines of Israel who took what is called the vow of the Nazareth, which was another way of saying that they were totally dedicated to the service of God. And so he said, some of your young men as Nazareth's, is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But listen, but you gave the Nazareth's wine to drink. Nazareth's took a vow to abstain from wine. But you gave the Nazareth's wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, do not prophesy. That is how the church is in many ways. Sadly, and I love the church, a member of the body of Christ universal, not just Calvary Chapel. I love the church. I love the believers who love Jesus. They're my brother, my sister. I love the church. I don't say this to condemn anybody, but it's the truth. It's the truth. We have members of the church who are trying to get the consecrated ones to drink and trying to get the people not to speak the truth. That's happening today. That has happened in the past. A fourth thing is the pastor's authority is challenged. It's, a, it's challenged very often by people who have independent individual interpretation. And so they'll say things like, you know, he said this, but I believe that. Who is your pastor? Well, your pastor isn't me, necessarily. I know that. Your pastor, very often, is the one that you're going to go to lunch with afterwards who's going to perhaps bring up this message and convince you that what I'm saying isn't correct. That's your pastor. The one who is influencing you to reject what you're being taught. Because after all, that guy's just old, he's not with, he doesn't understand, and Pokemon's really fun. I mean, that's what you're going to end up with. And I know that. And I know that. Because that's what happens. I realize that. So a pastor's authority, if that man is faithful, if he's dividing the word of God, if he's, he's been faithful to do that, even so, there are those who would ne never even read the Bible as a, as a hobby who will come and dispute that. And yet, Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. 
consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. He went on in verse 17 of Hebrews 13 to say, Obey your leaders, submit to their authority. Why? They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So that their work would be a joy and not a burden. It doesn't take a thousand people to drive a pastor out of a pulpit. It takes five to ten who are constantly bickering and complaining to get him tired of the whole church. And ultimately what happens is the pastor needs to understand, and so do the sheep, that you have an accountability for your life. Everyone will give an account of himself to God, Paul says, but at the same time, I give an account for my ministry. And because I give an account for my ministry to God, I am going to be very serious as I divide the word. Because especially in these last days, people will not endure healthy teaching. A fifth thing, false love has replaced genuine love. I call that sentimentalism. But that kind of false love, oh, just leave them alone, don't say anything, you don't want to judge them, has, has perverted the grace of God. And uh, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good works. And so rather than accepting sin in my brother or my sister, no, I don't judge them in that, in the, in that rigid legalistic sense, but I do encourage them. Love the Lord. And listen, you're, you're, you're not, your life isn't pleasing to God. You need to, you need to line up with Scripture so that God will bless your life and wash you and cleanse you from your sin. I still remember one of my friends at that time, was still a friend all these years later, who when I, when I said, and it was a young lady, and I, she, she had a habit of, of, I'll be honest, she had a ha habit of gossiping, and she just, she, she gossiped a lot, and then finally one day, and this was before Facebook, and, and, and so, <laughs> and so I, I said to her, you know, you know, your gossip is just, it's not a good thing. I still remember her response when she said to me, so when did God make you the Holy Spirit? And that's, and I said, well, just recently, but you know, no, no, um, <laughs> had a dream and a vision. No, uh, that's how people respond. Even though the scripture says this, I don't like the way you said it. You didn't smile at me or your heart wasn't broken. We, we find ways to justify our sinfulness. But the Bible says, Listen, if the Holy Spirit convicts us, turn from your sin so that the Lord might heal you. That's not love when you allow someone to remain in sin. That isn't love. Listen, I have two daughters and I have granddaughters, six granddaughters. And I'll be honest with you, if somebody were to come to the house to try to take out my grand, one of my granddaughters or whatever, if I met this guy and I knew he's a wolf, what kind of love would I be showing my grandbaby if I said, go out with him, it's okay, he's going to harm you, he's going to hurt you, he's going to devour your life, he's going to take from you the things that are most precious and go with my blessing. What kind of love would that be? What kind of love would that be? I knew a guy, I knew a guy who was not faithful to his wife, and I was aware of the situation, and, and he and I were talking on one occasion. He was not faithful to his wife, he was mistreating his wife, and I knew much of what was going on, and I met with him. And, and he had a daughter, and I still remember speaking to him, saying to him something like this. I said, you love your daughter, don't you? And he said, yes, I do. I said, you really love your little girl, don't you? She was just a little girl at that time. He goes, yes, I do. You really love her, don't you? Yes. Let me ask you a question. Okay, what are you going to do when somebody just like you shows up at the door to take your little girl out. What are you going to do when somebody just like you wants to take her out and do to her what you've been doing to your wife? Now, is that love or is Pastor David mean? That's called love. That's called love. I told him the truth. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You need to hear me because... I want your life blessed by God. And people don't want to hear it, especially today. Don't make me feel bad about myself. I'm not. That's called conviction. 
That's called conviction. It's when the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and saying, you need to get right. That's called conviction, not condemnation. God doesn't condemn. He convicts. You see, many pastors are afraid of offending sensitive hearers because they're afraid they're going to leave. So it leads them to water down the gospel. They don't give the truth. One of the things we need to remember is that Jesus never taught that being his follower was easy. He said the life of a believer can be difficult. It can be lonely. He said in Matthew 10, 34 through 36, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her, her mother, a, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. A Christian life can be filled with persecution and rejection. In Matthew 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Christian life is filled with trials. 1 Peter 1, 7 says, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it is tried with fire, might be found into praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Christian life is filled with self-denial. Jesus, in verse 24 of this chapter, said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. And so this commitment to discipleship is built on one thing, and it's built on his resurrection. A life that is earmarked by difficulty, loneliness, trials, and self-denial needs an eternal goal. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's why we look beyond this life towards the prize. Again, Paul said, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. We're in Olympic season. I like the Olympics. We're in Olympic season. These guys, you know, there's some amazing athletes like Bolt. That man can run. And I admire him. He's, his speed is unbelievable. And, and we have, you name it, any, any, any one of their events that they do from the track to the field. But I'm pretty sure that these athletes who win the gold didn't just decide one day to wake up, yawn, climb out of bed, put on some track shoes, and go and win a gold medal. I suspect that they must have worked hard with the goal of achieving that, disciplining and bring their body into subjection. And Paul spoke about that in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. And he said, I discipline myself. He said, I beat my body black and blue. I give myself black eyes. He says, lest after preaching to others, I might find myself to be a discard or a castaway, lest I find myself disqualified. I, I, I raced honorably, I fought honorably so that I might win the prize. And he said, the funny thing about these games that these people are, 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 are involved in is they do so to win a perishable, a perishable wreath. But we, we have an eternal that we're pressing towards. Listen. There are some things that are worth having. And one of those things that is worth having is a deep and powerful relationship with Christ. That is worth having. I was listening to a UFC fighter. They were speaking concerning this UFC fighter, and they were saying that this fighter works out nine hours a day. Three different segments of time where they work nine hours a day. I guarantee you they didn't just get up and go out there and get into their combat and end up winning. And, and they, what do they win? They win this little belt. It says UFC on it that you could go and have made for $10. You know, they also get a lot of things on top of that, like huge paychecks, not that big, but they make a lot for doing that. They discipline themselves for these things. Now, the Olympic athlete who's 25 years old wins the gold sitting in his, we'll say, den when he's 82, the little pot belly, and he used to be a power lifter, and somebody comes over and says, ah, you have the gold. Yes, I do. Can I see it? And he walks, <laughs> pulls it out. Wow, that didn't last. It never does. 
What is popular today is forgotten tomorrow. Don't forget that. What's popular today is forgotten tomorrow. We were just teasing. Just in between service, I was talking to some people in the worship team, and I said, I remember when they brought out the uh, cell phones. I said, it looked like it was like this big. You used to hold it like this. Huge thing. I almost wrote a dime. <laughs> and we had this huge walk around. You know, and now you've got these small phones. It just amazes me, the technology and how things go. And now we kind of laugh. I can remember when they had what were called records, and then it went to four-track tapes, actually reel-to-reel. -reel. Then it went to four-track tapes. Then it went to eight-track tapes. Then you ended up with these, these discs, these things you used to put the disc in, and you'd walk around, and then you'd have, you push random, and then you go, wow, I heard that 10 minutes ago, the same song, but it's on random, or shuffle, they called it. You know, and I watched the technology as it's grown, and we get, we're so addicted to what is new that we forget what is important, what's, what's not changing. What doesn't change is the gospel. What doesn't change is God's promises. What doesn't change is our hope in Christ. And that's why the pastor is supposed to teach the whole counsel of God so the body of Christ can go out and live it in a world that changes with an attitude, but there are some things that don't. And that's my relationship with God. So, in closing, Jesus is pointing these Pharisees and Sadducees to his resurrection. He said, you cannot discern the signs of the times. It should have been obvious to you, he's saying, that I'm Messiah. Remember the announcement of John the Baptist? You've noticed the multitude seeking my teaching and coming for miracles. These are all signs that are pointing to me, he is saying, as Messiah. But he calls them a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. Now, he's already spoken concerning that in, in cha chapter 12. But remember, he's referring to them as a wicked and adulterous generation. Wicked in that they're constantly tempting God, which reveals the evil in their heart, and adulterous because they're spiritually unfaithful to the Lord. They're wicked and adulterous because if they faithfully followed the Lord, they would have accepted him because Scripture foretold his coming. He has said in John 5, 46 and 47, If you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So you're asking for a sign. Well, the ultimate sign will be his victory over death. That's likened to Jonah, an event that Jesus, by the way, taught as fact and not as a story. And he's making it clear. Jonah is a foreshadowing of the event of my resurrection. You want a sign from heaven? My resurrection will be that. He says in Romans 1, 4, Paul says, And who, speaking of Jesus, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything that you believe, everything as a Christian that you believe, resides on one central fact, the resurrection. If Jesus Christ was not resurrected, then like Paul had already said, we of most men, of all men, are most miserable because we have taught that Jesus was raised from the dead. Everything is founded on and remains strong on that one thing. Keep that in mind. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything we believe rests on that. Buddha his bones are somewhere on the earth. Muhammad, his bones are somewhere on the earth. But Jesus Christ is alive. He's resurrected. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He is resurrected. And that is the sign, the sign of his resurrection that we have held fast to and believe because that validates every one of his teachings that he ever gave. For if Jesus Christ was not resurrected, I don't believe anything he says. But because he was everything he says, I can believe. Because he didn't lie to me, he told us the truth. It all stands on that, and that's why he points and says the sign of Jonah. For even as Jonah was in the belly of that great fish three days and three nights, even so the Son of Man shall be in the bowels of the earth. 
The point he's making is, but I will come out, even as Jonah came out of that whale, I will come out of the earth, I will be resurrected. That is the greatest sign, and that's what you'll see. Amen. And because they rejected the Lord, they ultimately die in their sin. It simply says here, he left them and departed.